Uh, hi, I'm Associate Professor Liz Everard. Uh, I'm currently um, Associate Professor of Neuroscience in Anesthesiology at Wild Cornell Medicine and uh, St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. We have done a lot of research looking at post-operative delirium. So initially we were interested in longer term cognitive deficits after anaesthesia and surgery, which go out to at least 12 months post-operatively. And in the last few years, we've become much more aware of the implications of the acute stages post-operatively whilst patients are still in the hospital suffering from delirium and the implications that that has on their longer term outcomes. So we've been very focused on that. It, um, it, it can appear in a, a very hyperactive state where the patients are very agitated, very um, uh, discombobulated, confused, uh, but it can also happen in a hypoactive state where patients are um, also very confused if you actually ask them the questions and may well be having hallucinations that they don't talk about unless you ask. The thing about delirium is that um, with the exception of the agitated state, which is um, a, a minimal amount of delirium, most delirium is hypoactive delirium and it mostly goes unnoticed because unless you run an appropriate test, you won't pick it up. The longer term implications of an episode of delirium in the post-operative period are not only an increased risk of dementia in the longer term, but also an increased risk of mortality. So patients are at greater risk of dying within the first 12 months post-operatively. Uh, patients are also at risk of um, falls and other complications, increased length of stay in the hospital. Uh, and what we really are not clear on yet is whether or not readmissions and further complications are also a direct result of an episode of delirium. Uh, it's a very serious issue. Um, interestingly, we're also at the moment doing some qualitative research on our patients um, about three years following cardiac surgery. and the post-traumatic stress that these patients are experiencing is really significant. So at the moment, the best interventions that we have are, uh, if you like, soft interventions, multi-component interventions, um, such as the uh, HELP guidelines from Sharon in a way, and Ed Mark Antonio, things like making sure we orient the patient, making sure the patient has their glasses and their hearing aids, trying to minimise uh, their um, transfers to, you know, I mean, people can undergo multiple transfers, they're lying in a bed looking at the ceiling, they have no idea where they've gone to or from. Uh, nutrition, early mobilisation, the sorts of things that we do for um, e ERAS um, surgeries, but, but actually with a focus on the brain. So we've kind of coined the term brain ERAS, and we think that those strategies are important. We are also undertaking a large study looking at preoperative optimization. So if you like a form of prehabilitation, looking at if we can optimise patients preoperatively, educate them. One of the really important things people say um, post-operatively is they wish they had known. If they suffer from delirium, they wish they had understood. And certainly with respect to orientation and um, hearing aids and visual aids, patients' families can be involved in that if they know. So that kind of pre-operative um, education for families and for patients, uh, pre-operative optimisation of, of medications. A lot of elderly patients come into hospital with a large number of uh, pharmaceuticals and polypharmacy is, is a direct um, risk factor for an episode of delirium. So there are things that we 
can do preoperatively that are likely to reduce the likelihood of an episode and therefore reduce the long-term implications. There's also a lot of work um, from our group and and others looking at biomarkers. Um, So um, although we're unclear on the mechanisms behind delirium, it does look like there is an inflammatory component. Um, There may in fact be downstream neuronal effects and we are looking at biomarkers that may give us an opportunity to predict patients who are at risk. Absolutely. At the moment, we know that increasing age, a history of delirium and uh, any sort of subtle cognitive impairment at baseline puts a patient at increased risk. We are not currently... um, screening adequately for preoperative risk factors for delirium. So we're not doing routine screens for cognition preoperatively in every hospital and around the world globally. Um, and that's something that we, we would be advocating as, as a first line. It's the leading predictor of further cognitive impairment and, and an episode of delirium. So routine cognitive screening for patients 65 years or more really has to be our very uh, very first thing that we should be doing. Um, yes, well, high risk is really anyone 65 years or more coming in for any sort of procedure. Those patients should have some sort of screening. Ideally, Ideally, it would happen sometime prior to their admission so that patients who are flagged as having some sort of subtle impairment or more significant impairment have an opportunity to undergo um, a full assessment and perhaps be educated um, with their families and the surgeon and the multidisciplinary team who are hopefully caring for them to make sure that they're making the right decision about going ahead with the surgery. Absolutely. Absolutely. It needs to be something that's quick to administer and doesn't require a lot of training. And if that tool were available, um, that would be a huge step forward. So one of the things that we're doing in Australia is uh, trying to develop policy in our hospitals around the new cognitive care standards, which were released in 2016. And so... Our hospital at St Vincent's in Melbourne, um, along with many other hospitals around the country, are developing quite specific guidelines around identification of patients at risk preoperatively and on admission for medical patients and also screening during their hospital stay. One of the difficulties uh, is that there are no resources to support these policy changes at this time. So whilst policy can be changed, it's not going to hit the ground where the patients are until there are resources to support it. Um, Similarly, the American Society of Anesthesiologists are doing a heap of work looking at trying to implement exactly the same sorts of policy changes at a high level and they will hopefully feed down to hospitals but I think we need the recognition that this doesn't just need policy change, it needs the resources to implement those policy changes as well.